that sense, what kinds of catalysts are we still looking for this week or maybe in the coming weeks? Uh, we mentioned that we need a catalyst to see that cup and handle really come to fruition. Uh, so what, what are we expecting? What are we looking forward to? Yeah, I feel like this is almost similar to... So if we go to the daily again, this is pretty similar to the 24th when uh, back in Feb when the price shot up. And just to let everybody know, this was not a gamma squeeze, but um, this was somebody buying. So there was a small gamma component to it, but this was a large institution buying in. Um, I think what we might need is something similar. Uh, it just happened with like Palantir back when Palantir was like 15 bucks. No, there was no catalyst. And then suddenly you have all these institutions piling in and the price goes to like 20, 25. Hmm. Um, and you know, something like that happened back in Feb. Uh, I think, I think, I think, you know, people, people are going to say, Oh, you're crazy, right? You're just waiting for a chance, right? For someone to buy in. But I think, I think we are waiting for somebody to buy in somebody to buy in who can drive the stock up. Uh, and I know that's like a lot of chance, um, who would be buying in right now. Um, people on Reddit saying, oh, okay, we're setting up for a gamma ramp. I don't, uh, in my opinion, I don't think we have any technical catalysts. Um, and I'll be clear why, because, uh, a, you, you don't gamma squeeze on Wednesdays. You, that, that, that doesn't happen. Hmm. Um, it could be a setup for a Friday, but again, like, as I said, Ivy's still really high right now. Okay. I, Ivy calls is really high. Um, they're not going to let zero DT, um, calls be purchased on Friday if they see anything crazy going on. Um, so with a lack of call contracts that you can buy and with the stock still trading around four times as high as it did back when it was $40, um, you can't buy much, uh, you can't buy as many shares. So that means no gamma, no gamma squeeze. Uh, so at, that would be a technical catalyst. Uh, so I, in my opinion, I think we're waiting for someone to buy in. Speaking of that uh, original institutional investor, do you think that that person's still in? And we were expecting that this was the plausible deniability story. If the if the uh, earnings call was good, or at the very least it was like not bad, we were expecting the, uh, the hedge funds that are long GME, the long whales, to be able to come in and swoop up all the profits and take us along with them to Tendi Town. What happened to them? Uh, are they still biding their time? And, uh, and let's talk about the kinds of four that dropped us from 350 to 170 earlier if it weren't for them who did who was the one that did that oh yeah the 350 to 170 drop um so that was so so this right here was uh i'll, I'll call it i'll call it no i'll call it lw this was long whales mm -hmm. in my opinion if it wasn't long whales uh, the floor would be much lower. We'd be crashing to like 70 right now as we're speaking. Uh, but the long whales, they're the ones propping the floor up. Um, they're the one who's, they're the ones who've created the floor. Um, this portion of the rally was probably from momentum algos, day, day traders. So the true floor is around here. So around this level, which is like in the one hundreds, like 100 to 150 range. We've since raised the floor from retail buying, and so we're in like the 120 to 140 to 150 range. So that's the true floor of the stock, I think. Uh, regarding the run up to the 350s, so I covered this in my live stream. Um, on Monday, this was a short whale. This was short whale plus retail, uh, plus algos. So this portion was the short whale buying. And pumping the stock this portion was retail well it, these portions happen every single day in small in small repeating patterns but basically you have the short wheels pumping it you have everybody else continuing that trend and so this whole operation was a was a in my opinion it was a pump and dump mm. so they wanted to get the stock nice and high and uh, nice and unsustainable to this 350 level and once they got it there, they were able to do some sideways. Uh, they were able to control the stock and make it trade sideways. Um, and so what happened is they bought puts whenever the stock was too high and they were buying calls or stock 
when the stock was too low. Um, and so when you keep it going sideways, uh, a lot of people on Wall Street bets, what they did is they bought OTM call options. Uh, and so by forcing it to go tri- uh, forcing it to go sideways, the people who bought these OTMs, they bought it from the short whale hedge funds. So when they expire out of the money, the short whales are profiting off of them, off the premiums, right? Because it's so high since the IV is so high. And they themselves are making money off of their arbitrage uh, by keeping the trading sideways and using their put strategy. So this, I think this, to summarize, this whole section here was just a pump and dump by short whales. And they just want to make a quick buck, basically. So the short whales, the ones that made a quick buck, the long whales, why were they powerless to stop whatever was happening here? And are they, once again, are they still in with us? So I don't think they were involved in this region besides swooping in, I think, over here to save the stock from gaining too much downwards momentum and crashing. Mm -hmm. Uh, The reason why is because if they continued this pump, I think this whole thing was was planned down to the minute by the short side. So if they if they tried this, this would have been a bull trap for long wheels. And it would have been expensive for them to buy in at that level, especially when Ivy was at the highest uh, during this climb. So I think what they did is just they just prevented the stock from crashing. And they essentially they're just biding their time right now. Uh, will they come back in right around this spot? That's something I don't know. Um, I'm currently doing some research on that, and I will update people if I find out. Borden Elite is a daily charter of GME. He has been basically one of the three founding fathers of uh, DD Rensel, c- collaborates, conglomerates all of the DD for every single day, uh, and Warden does daily charting. So one uh, one of the questions that I did have about Future Catalyst is a share recount. So a share recount. What do you know? What do you think? And what is your opinion on how, how that would change the story? Is that a catalyst? Uh, so I consider things like that to be technical catalysts. Uh, if you look at dry ship, for example, uh, the catalyst for dry ship was the reverse stock split. And that's a really deadly tool that you can use to trigger a short squeeze. It's not going to happen with GME because you do a reverse split when the price of the stock is relatively cheap. Uh, what a reverse split it does it is you take multiple uh, cheap stocks and you combine them into a, a more expensive stock unit. And the opposite version is a split where you take one stock and then you, you split it into multiple chunks, kind of like how Tesla did it. In either way, I think I think uh, it will affect. It will possibly trigger a squeeze, uh, with the reverse split being the most effective. A share recount, a share recount. I think people were talking about June, uh, and voting. Uh, that that I'm not like really sure about, but I have heard that if you do recall shares for counting, you will have to the wh- whoever if you're lending a share, if that share is being lent, it has to be covered. Right. So sure, that could be a technical catalyst, but that's something I know less about. Well, uh, maybe something that's already been happening starting on Friday and may and has finished up uh, its process now is ETF rebalancing, specifically XRT. So is the, in that sense, uh, since you described recount as a technical catalyst, is that also a technical catalyst? And what is it? What is it likely to do? So I think some people. So again, I'm catching up on all these uh, upcoming catalysts, but people were saying that... I can take this one. Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. And then I can can fill in from uh, with what I know. So XRT rebalancing was in the very beginning parts of this channel. One of the first indications that March 19th was going to be a large uh, day for attention and uh, also ultimately was one of the driving factors behind Pixel's DD about March 19th as well. The idea is that Every ETF has is like a fruit basket of stocks, right? You don't want to buy a single stock uh, because you are afraid what orange might not be orange season, might not be banana season soon. You take out a fruit basket. But the nature of an ETF is to be able to have that uh, 
mitigated risk from all different factors of that stock, which means that you should only have up to, depending on the ETF, about 1% in your fruit basket of that stock. Now imagine that uh, is it just a fresh, whole, uncut cantaloupe inside your fruit basket. That's what GME looks like in XRT. That is where the uh, short whales, right, the hedge funds that have we've been fighting against this entire time, uh, they that's where they have been keeping a good amount of their shorts for GME. Now XRT, like a lot of ETFs, need to rebalance on a regular basis, and XRT specifically historically rebalances every three months. When they do rebalance, they're going to realize there's way too much GME in here, so they're going to want have to sell. So we expected that downward pressure. However, if these uh, shares don't actually exist, as in they are lent out and sold, uh, that means that they actually have to go out and find that share, buy it, uh, maybe at market value, depending on if they can find a borrower for that, and then they sell. So we were expecting a lot of t price turbulence on that specifically.